Hi there. Welcome to Music Corner Symphonizing Project Episode 18. I'm David Kulma. Today, I had enough time to work on the opening of Mahler 9 before the broadcast today. So we're doing just Mahler for the first hour here today because making a reduction of a complicated texture of a late Mahler symphony is enough to get you to spend all your preparation time doing that. So we'll just have two symphonies today. So in the second hour, I'll be talking about the end of the exposition of Beethoven 1. So we're finally to the closing section. Should be able to get to the end of exposition and wrap up the whole thing in the next couple of days here. The next few episodes, that is. So, all right. So, this is Mahler's last completed symphony, 1908 or so. And um, it, uh, I've written here, languid opening. So it just, uh, it doesn't take, it, it, it takes its sweet time in the beginning here to get anywhere. Kind of spins, it's sort of like a little eddies of, of a pool or something for a while. And it slowly winds its way up to some cool things in the beginning. Well, the symphony's well worth the time. It's just uh, fascinatingly, he's he's not in a hurry. Um, the other symphony I was thinking about for today was um, Haydn's last symphony, which there's no question about what's going on at the beginning. It's a big, big, uh, big tattoo in D major. Just ba 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 ba, something like that. I can't remember the exact gesture. I downloaded the score. Let's take a look. Nope. Okay, no, I didn't download the score. I was going to, but I didn't get that far. So it's just a big, I think I sang Schumann, but it's based on the, the Haydn symphony. Anyway, something completely different. So I've been able to, making a, it's a quasi reduction because <laughs> the texture is so complicated. So take a listen to the opening here. And I get basically to the big loud D minor thing after a few pages. And then we're going to look in extreme detail for the next hour here. <laughs> All right. So here's the very beginning of Mahler 9 in MIDI.
And so there I was. I only have about a third of the texture in that last bar and a half. But I got the whole bar with the big loud chord. So, so I got to midway through page four. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a delight. Anyway, so, uh, this is really wonderful music. So, the, um, so, we're in D. If, I don't even remember if this is what the, how they list the key of this. So they say D minor, I don't even remember. Anyway, so we're, we're around D. We've got a D major key signature at the opening. So let's take a look. So this is, this is very different than dealing with a Beethoven symphony when the texture is basically two or three things at once, maybe four. But generally, uh, this texture throughout the opening of this is going to be very elaborate. Doing, doing a very, it's not a very complicated thing it's doing. I might have difficulty describing it, but the orchestration is, is interesting enough that it, it takes a bit to determine. So, so we're on Dante Komodo, and so at the beginning here we have uh, the cellos play a low A at the bottom of the treble cl bass clef, and so they play a dotted rhythm of quarter note dotted quarter note eighth so bomb bomb and so that uh sort of quasi syncopation at the very end of this little gesture after they accent the opening note then there's an eighth note rest let me actually pull out i i spent all this time making this reduction i might as well use it too so happens here and the horns in F, so that's a low, so bass clef, so this is the fun part about transposing horns, depending, it depends on the score, but um, based on everything, it's this, some, it depends on when they use bass clef for horns, usually you transpose in the opposite direction from the triple clef, meaning it's, so this is a low E down, written down here. And the actual note the horn player is playing is this one, which is an A above that E in bass clef. So it's the same A as this um, cello note, mainly because the one down there is not available to a horn player. So basically, this is the lowest A the horns can play, an F horn can play. I'm not sure that's absolutely true, but. It's basically how the bass clef works is you transpose up for some reason. But that's it's been going on for a long time. So same A, so same note in the um, in the fourth horn. Then that all repeats. So but notice it's syncopated, so it happens on the and of three. So if I'm gonna write out, you know, so the basic the basic rhythmic system, if you've ever learned how to count rhythms, would be one, two, three, four for four quarter notes. And then you would, to do eighth notes, you would say in English would be and. So if that was a, a full bar of eighth notes, one and two and three and four and. So the opening measure has us get one and then the, then the and of two and then the and of three. So the composite rhythm that is when we put two people's music together and where they start notes and then we can call that the composite rhythm so we're doing the bomb 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 so that's that's what's happening so three articulations of the same a twice in the cello and once in the fourth horn so then the fourth horn holds their first one over so that we don't get any break between the horn and the uh, cello. And then in the next measure, so this is all, all of this is an A, which is the dominant. So, but it's, you really can't tell that yet. It's just, it's just A. What are you going to do with it? And then the, the harp enters and plays on beats one two and four and then one this pattern uh, 
So another thing you want to notice about the way that the the way that the um, composers start writing this is you know 100 years after Beethoven's writing his symphonies, the say the first first half of them or so, um, that the dynamics are specifically to get the specific humans to play a certain volume. Uh, they're more kind of like specific to the player dynamics rather than this is the dynamic I want the whole orchestra to play. So that's what usually happens in, say, Beethoven symphonies. This, I want this, everybody, play forte, play forte, everybody. And the result is supposed to be everybody play forte. So the cellos are pianissimo, the horn is piano, and the harp is forte. And a forte harp is about as loud <laughs> as a piano horn player. So then, so they want accented notes that want some extra pluck going on in the low harp here. So so we're getting this mixed with our A. So this is the this is the third, the fifth, and the sixth scale degree. So we have back down to um, back down to five. So we have um me so la so that's the solfege there, me so la so so the for uh, move, uh, movable though. So um, so we're still, this is, this is still kind of not completely D-ish, but those are all notes in D. So we're kind of in this suspended feeling of what's going on. I'm not really sure. Okay, so that's the first few bars. And then when the A arrives in the harp, the cellos return. They had been gone for a measure, but they return to their gesture from the very first bar. And, and at the same time, the double basses play, uh, that's the word for flagellet. That means uh, harmonic. So the double basses are, instead of playing a normal note where they finger everything, where they put the string all the way down, and so then they, they're only activating the part of the string from their finger to the, um, what's that called, the, the bridge? So that only that specific string length is sounding, not all the string above that. So, but with a with a harmonic, what you do instead is you 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 kind of lightly touch a place on the string. Here, it happens to be the A string, and this would be the I think you touch there, whatever. I, uh, my remembrance of string um, harmonic notation is uh, rusty, but I looked this up, and this is in fact the the note he wants to come out is this one. So it means that it's the same A that the cellers are playing. So it sounds an octave lower than this notation. So it's one of the um, one of the open harmonics of the A string on a on a double bass. So I've put that down here. They're playing. Where did that go? It's right there. I had to make this reduction. I had to have bowed strings and pluck strings to get it to sound right. So so that's supposed to be. And that's this boat. So I have I have that one, but I get more all the pizzicato that happens later. All right. So so same A. We haven't gotten any different A's yet from them, but then we get a. Uh, this is supposed to be stopped. I didn't have enough time to work out all the stuff to get a stopped horn sound for this measure. But so they're they're covering up the the bell so much that they get this very, very brassy sound. And they actually have to finger everything a half step higher, half step lower, because they, they really raise the pitch so high. Anyway, but those are the notes that are supposed to come out, transposed, of course. So then the horn melody here, which is, horn melody plays this, plays A, D, C sharp, <clears throat> F sharp, B. So there's our first D, but it doesn't happen until beat two. So I'm going to do. So notice we got a we get more rhythmic stuff going on. So this is one two, and then it's on the and of three. I'm going to put the three in parentheses to show that it isn't being played. And then on the end of four is the F sharp, and then the downbeat of the next bar. So. So this up here, I'm sorry. So 
So this is the first signal we get that it's D major-ish. But notice that the gesture ends on B. So that means that we're sort of getting to a point where we're kind of emphasizing B at the end of the gesture here. So the whole thing sounds something like, you know, so let me actually play. So it's still, it's all rather mysterious sounding. And so then in the next bar here, so in this, so we still get the, the horn enters as expected on the end of three on that low A. That's the fourth horn versus the first horn here. Let me double check. No, it's the second horn player. So second and fourth horns. And so the, the, um, the harp starts staying in playing F sharp and A, so we get an F sharp here on the downbeat rather than then. So they, they enter, they join the texture of the first couple of bars here. And then we get a, a new entrance here of the violas. They're playing F sharp and A. So that joins our, but they're playing 16th, uh, 16th note sextuplets. So dooba dooba dooba. And then this is a, he wants an echo effect of the, uh, of an open horn, same player, and they play the outer notes of this A, D, C sharp, F sharp, B. It's just, he, re he reduces that to just the first and the last note, which meant, which gives us A, 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 B. So we're starting to set up this pattern of, emph of emphasizing A and then emphasizing B. A followed by B. Literally the pitch is A and B. So, and everything keeps going. So that B, that A here, B, lines up with the harp going B, F sharp, A. So they're kind of wandering around in the same soup, as it were. And so then at the end of the line here, we get some pickups to some more stuff. So let me zoom back out here so that I can see what I'm doing. Yeah, so there are two statements of that. And so now the cellos enter playing A. That's the, he's divided the cello section in half. And so the first half, half of them, the upper part, upper cello, up, you know, each, there's two ways of dividing the cellos. You can divide them by stand, and so if three stands will play this, and the three or all of whatever will play that. So there are two players at each stand. So they can play together, or you can have the outer and inner players. So one player who is, so one player per stand plays each part when you divide them in half, and so each stand has a person playing each part. That's up to the conductor and the section and the players, how they decide to divide that up. So the horn does its A pickup, the harp plays its B pickup, and then the first violins, in addition to the A pickup and the cellos, is doing the second violins enter with an F sharp. So that's a big, so that's, so that's, uh, what was that? It was A, it was F sharp, it's B, which is actually down here. So A, B, F sharp, and A. So there's an A there. So the F sharp's on top. So it's uh, what's it? It's uh, this. That's that sound right there. Notice I'm not even bothering doing an attempt to come up with like Roman numerals. Okay. And so that's a pickup to a, a wider texture and our first D major chord. And so we get. We get a pizzicato low D down here in the basses, which is this note right here, which you probably can't see. The cellos have that A down to D slur. And so they play. 
and then the and the horn moves from A up to B. And the first violin, no, sorry, second violins move from their F sharp down to E. So of those four notes, what ends up happening is the A goes to that, goes to a D. The harp B goes to an A and the D on the bottom. And then they also play D and F sharp. So there's extra D and F sharp notes here. And so that gives us that there's a D major chord arpeggiated in the harp, so they play all the notes in a row. That's what that squiggle means. So you go from the bottom to the top. So boom ba da boo. Sound like something like this. I'm sorry, it's like it's actually yeah, this. It's an F sharp and an A up there. I'm making pitch mistakes. If you want to hear the MIDI do it, it's this. Yeah, something like that. But instead of getting F major notes, right, having the F sharp say stay in the whole, in the second violin, they go down to E, and, and we're expecting that B to show up in the um, in the horn. They've played A B a couple of times already, so so that means we're getting this sonority. It actually sounds like this. Ba -da. And so that that D A F F sharp A B and E gives us a quasi nine quasi nine flavor that is a ninth chord. But so there's a very clear D major ness to this, but it's extra pitches, and they're all important notes, right? So what we'd expect is that the B and the E would be some kind of non-chord tone on, in like earlier music, right? So the, the we expect the melody in the violins to go F sharp, E, D, so we get a... We expect something like that. But Mahler does... And there's a rest. And he does it again. There's F sharp E right there. So he's he's creating the the he's creating a situation where you're going to get um, you feel like you're going to get a resolution, but he doesn't give you the resolution. So it's it's suspended. It's there's no that the the sort of unsettled bubbling feeling of this is just continuous rather than resolving to something a little less common, and then more, more tension. It's kind of a minimum, mi middle level of tension, which gives us this kind of murky feeling. You know, major key sounding murky. So I don't know if it was just kind of um, like a big, like a white screen or something. So that the horn also, you'd expect the same, that the horn would go A, B, they might go back down to A. Or go up to oh, go all the way up to D, but they don't do that either. So we get, and so those two things happening together, the second violin and the and the horn. So we get. And so I just love the way that sounds. Right, so um, so we get the second. The viola is also split in half now. That's that's a German abbreviation meaning divided. So the upper violas, the first viola part, is doing an elaborated version of their F to A. This this notation means this is a these are sixteenth note tremolos, and they're going to last a beat basically. And so they have to be dotted because it would be a dotted a dotted quarter triplet value equals a quarter note here to get six notes. That's the reason for the word notation. But they're basically just doing the same rhythm from before. But they do. That's what happens. And so that's, that's how I've written it out over here. 
Yeah, so it's just that. And while that's happening, the second viola, I'm sorry, the second half of the viola is play F sharp A B. So the, the texture is the same. They're playing the same pitches. I can't play them at the same time. I'm gonna play one down the octave just to give you an idea. So they're the, playing the same line, just the sixth, the the sextuplet rhythm is um, sort of elaborating the pizzicato uh, second violas, and so and then this gesture, this two bar, this bar that I just really really overanalyzed, it happens again. So there, it happens twice in a row. So here's that bar with the pickup twice. So we're setting up this kind of, there's sort of a dominant tonicness to going on, like D, A to D in the bass. But all the upper voices don't finish that same level of gesture. They kind of move away from the tonic in the second in the second chord instead of being in it. So, how is he going to keep going here? So then we actually start getting full like a ton, um, movement across instead of being sort of one chord to another, we have start on a chord, move to something else and then keep going in one measure. This is what this is this bar here with the pickup in the horn, second horn and the second violins. So notice here that the on, so the basses are doing something, they go D, C sharp to B. That's the basses pizzicato plus the harp. So that's all in the same octave. So multiple people plucking. And on top of that is still happening the the F sharp A the F sharp A B that is happening in the violas. But it lines up this way where the B in the violas lines up with the C sharp here. And there's also an A in this sixteenth sextuplet. And then the 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 cellos before we're playing the second half of the cellos are playing a, a up to F sharp, and now they play an A which goes with the D. But the next note is a G. So with the A here that's in the viola. So we're getting a dominant sound here, A G and C sharp with that B. So it's. expected to go to D that's what that's happening so I'm doing yep so there's a sort of a tonic sound a dominant sound and then but the bases then go down to B so we're getting I'm gonna write it out this way so T D and then in that system, a, a B would imply six chords, so a, like a tonic substitute, that's what the X means. So we're, we're kind of, he's pulling out the rug from under you with that B there. Right, so then, notice the upper parts do not play that fourth beat here. Um, the first violin, the second violins are playing, they play F, A, A, F sharp, A, A. I'm playing single wrong pitches. F sharp, A, A. So notice that the alternating texture here of them playing two notes and then the accompaniment is continuing for a little bit here. But the we get a new voice now in the three clarinets. He likes to have three people playing one line together. He likes to do that, Mahler does. And so they're playing that is C sharp and G sharp, C sharp and G natural. 
that's underneath the violin line. So let's see, that was the violist. So we had C sharp holds over and we go to G natural. So again, that fits the pattern of a five chord, but notice it doesn't line up exactly in terms of where all the dominant notes versus the tonic notes are. And this more melodic gesture in the horns, in the second horn, that's what we're expecting, something like that. So this is so mi re do. So that's five three two one. That's what we've been waiting for, but it happens in the midst of things, and the second violins have already moved on by that point. So by the time the D shows up, it's hum harmonized by the B in the bass, and we've got G and B in the second violin. So instead of being a six tonic substitute it becomes kind of like a four chord, right? So we're going one to five, six, five, to four, six. That's kind of what's out being outlined here with lots of overlapping other stuff, but basically it's one to five, six, five, to four, six. If you want to include that C sharp in the first part, you could say it's a one tonic seven chord. So let me play from the pickup there, just that bar. Notice, I mean, so it's, there's some sort of sense of tonic, there's some sense of dominant, and then something that isn't going back to tonic, exactly. So we're going from our home to away to somewhere else. <laughs> right, so then that gesture repeats, the chordal, the chordal accompaniment gesture repeats, does happens a second time, just like before. So the violas are the same, the cellos and the basses are the same, the harp is the same, the clarinets do the same gesture, they just don't play on the downbeat. So they're mimicking the accompaniment now starting on C sharp, moving to G. Then the horn plays a modification of its opening melody to fit that line too, and does, this is F sharp, D, E. So, so we're getting these lines of still uh, basically fitting this basic harmonic pattern here. So notice it takes the G here in the, in the um, clarinet that is the, f the seventh of this chord. And it doesn't resolve in the next, the next beat, it stays. And that's uh, the definition of a deceptive resolution of five going to a four, six, is that that note staying is the thing that creates the four sonority. So, so but the melody does an elaborated version of its previous bar, which was that F sharp A. Now it does. So notice that it allows, that allows the, the second violin here to, so we get the opening that, um, F sharp, which um, doesn't necessarily fit with that A70 kind of thing that's happening in that beat. But then there's G, B, which does fit that G chord that is being described, I've described for that beat. And then we get a B, suspension but there's nobody to suspend off of because everybody stopped playing <laughs> so, so it's just the b by itself and it resolves by step as expected down to a um, to fit in the d major chord that happens on that beat so it's it's becoming more and more um, clear that there's some sort of d majoriness happening but it's by fits and starts, small little moments, repeat the gesture, this leaves out, we modify this a little, right? This is, this is the slow going action of this, um, this music here. So then um, he modifies it again in the next measure, only slightly, yet again. So the clarinets are still playing C sharp to G the horn now modifies its F sharp E D to F sharp E. So let me 
I'm going to write this one down in order so we can see it. So C sharp and G in the clarinet. So I'm going to put clarinet. That's three clarinets, by the way, pianissimo all together. Now above them is the F. This is the horn, second horn by itself, plays F sharp to E. Then all the way below this is the harp, and the harp plays in a, a, a sustained A, and below that D, C sharp, and B. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna write the A as a three A's in a row. So this A is new to the texture, a sustained A. So the pickup to this bar in the second violin is a new gesture, but it's the C sharp G that we've heard the clarinet do. So now, but it's done as a pickup. So this is violin two and they're above everybody. So that's up here. So violins. So I'm going to have to move everybody over one to put this in. And so we get C sharp G. And then they get to the downbeat that is also, is again, open with a, a B. So that's the pattern of the expecting the B on the downbeat. But this time they hold the B over. So this... is the next is the new gesture there and then we get modifica modifications of most of the other parts so this harp line which is also in the double bass is the d c sharp b on beats two three and four and the cellos i'm going to write them as vc violoncello violoncello they play an f sharp and then an A. So the sustained A that happens in the harp happens in the second half of the cellos. This is the second half of the cellos they finally enter. And the violas do, again, they're doing um, sort of the same line slightly joined up together. And so that gives us a B and A in the first one. So they play B then A in the one line here and go down to G, and they keep the A going in the upper part. So, and then when the B happens, the violin, who did not play on that beat, does its C-sharp G yet again. So notice here that this basic pattern here, D, A, F-sharp, the B and the A, so the A stays, and the C-sharp, and the F-sharp, and the B. So all that's happening together. So we get something like so that is basically a one chord with an added six that's the B and it has the seven too so C sharp so it's it's a, a D major seven chord with an added sixth is one way to think about it and then the next beat is very clearly a five six five C sharp, A, A, G, and A, and E. That's it. And then on the next beat, we get B and A is still holding, and we get C sharp and G in the violin. So it's this thing. So he's making that G major bit, which wasn't was only there a couple of times. It's more complicated now. So you get the idea. This is how elaborate and complicated and, I wouldn't say complicated, precise Mahler is being in this music. So this continues for a bit where we, we're alternating D chords and then we, we cut off the B and we still get our A. So we're going D to A. And then there's a the little melodic gesture in between that again is moving from five, C sharp and G, to B, which is supposed to resolve to A, but you don't get the resolution. So the B becomes part of the chord, or at least is just held on through, if you like. 
And so then the seconds take on a longer tune, which is this. And this time, um, we keep going down in the bass from D to C sharp to B to A. And so this B here happens at the same time as the D major chord was. So now it becomes kind of a B minor seven. And then we do get our A's being suspended, but nobody else is playing. And that is a G. So there's a seven here. This is the clarinet line. And that F sharp is a B. So A, G, and B. And then we get a B flat at the end of the bar to go with our F sharp G. And this is the first time where the the inner accompaniment here starts doing instead of two and three beats on playing on beats two and three, they play on beat two and on beat four. And so we're kind of one measure one is other stuff, measure two is them, measure three is other stuff, measure four is them. So G and A this time with the empty and the B flat. So it's just getting more a little more dissonant here. So listen to the first page. It's, um, I'm gonna just gonna show you the yeah let's let's zoom in a little bit not that much there you go So the, that opening phrase there of the slowly building up and the seconds and the horns playing kind of themes kind of cooperating and going against each other, that gets picked up with that little slide to G with the B flat. Sorry, not to G, but to, with the B flat there. So then we get the D major feeling. Again, that's a B. And the clarinet, so doing it's F sharp. <laughs> yeah, F sharp's in the chord. So we go back to this sort of A sense here. So D and A. So it's kind of moving back and forth. That's that's what's happening in some sense. And so that uh, the pick the C sharp G gesture, C sharp G B that gets picked up in the second horn as a part of repeating that. So this, the thing we heard in the second violin happens here in the horn now, over a few bars. And then we get a 6-4 bar. So we extend this 4-4 measure by two beats to um, extend the, the uh, this is the English horn here. That's a fifth lower, they're like the horn. So it's F sharp, E, G, F sharp, E, A, G sharp, F sharp, E. And so that gives us a, so this, he extends the tonic a little bit. So he's extending going up the, right? So we start from F sharp, we go to G, we go to A, but we're emphasizing the same arrival pitch of F sharp E, F sharp E, and then F sharp gets extended here and E. So the F sharp holds on over when the A comes. So there's a D chord and an A chord. And so that little pause there then allows us to restart with a more, complica a more complicated texture. And now the firsts finally enter on square two here, rehearsal number two. And um, so there's, it's a much more elaborate texture. It took me forever to type this out because um, in order to write this all down in a way that I could understand, 
I had to write the pizzicato cellos and the pizzic pizzicato bass, the pizzicato cellos that are in between arco, they're bowing in between, which I put up here. And then the violas, this is the second viola line and that's the first viola line. And then I had to write three parts up here. So the cellos when they're bowing, the seconds and the firsts. But so this is the basic same set of things that's happening. It's just, it's a little bit more elaborated. So we're emphasizing D and A on the downbeat here in the, that's the harp, D and A, go A, D. So it's D every bar. This is an A being held by the horns, which I've written up here, it's that one. So we get a, a dominant pedal during these tonic chords. And in the middle of the bar, we emphasize B, which resolves to A at the end of the bar. But the, the way that the, each line here gets through this D major is very different. So the, so the cellos are doing. And then they go and they keep going from there. So they're doing D and A and then A, B, A. So it's just five, six, five, right? So the, the violas are still doing the same thing they've been doing. Second violins now, though, do... So we get the, we get the G sharp, C sharp again. But so we get E, B resolving to A, so that's what we expect. And then we go down the scale, G sharp, G, F sharp, E, D. So again, he's emphasizing notes not in the chord on the downbeat in the tonic. The tonic chord so E is a step too high so is the B here and then the first violins do a nice so that E there is um, emphasized um, even though it's a step below the F sharp he's going to go to so it's another note that's not in the chord so we're getting that B and E at the same um, B and E at the same time and then they resolve at different times then we do two A pickups on the A with the bass so they're doing the same thing. So we're getting accented dissonances on the downbeat when the A and the D, when the D chord hits. And so that happens. So both of them are doing it, but with different lines. And then the cellos are emphasizing in the middle of the bar a note that's not in the D chord. And then the clarinet is also um, elaborating on the second violin line. So these are the two notes in the second violin, B and A. These are the E and the D here. And then they just play because there aren't two notes here. He doesn't resolve the second violin note this time in the C sharp, it would go up to D. And he just holds on to it. So the second clar the clarinet just plays C sharp with them. And then he joint then the clarinet joins on C sharp and uh, G and C sharp. So it's just very elaborate. But they're all doing versions of the same thing, just different lines together. So it gives us a multi, uh, multi-layered feeling. Okay, and so then on the next beat here. So the first violins at the beginning of the next line, again, they play E resolving to D. And so there should be, you would expect there to be a D chord here again, but the B in the second violin just stays. It doesn't resolve to A. The chord in the middle is the same, but there isn't a D that happens on the downbeat. So like a, a low D, but you're expecting one. But the A does come in. We get an A chord here in the middle of the bar. And so we're doing our that gesture we've heard a bunch of times, the C sharp G, B, that's in the first right there. And so we're doing more versions of this where we're just emphasizing the same gestures over and over again in different elaborations. And so the clarinets extend, they kind of create a secondary line with the second violins here. I didn't think of it this way. So the, notice here that this is B, if I'll show you up here. So B, A, the resolution of the B to the A in the seconds is happening in the clarinet. So they're kind of feathering between each other, a single line. And then this is actually just a, yeah, 
because this is D, C sharp, B, and this is B, A, G, so they're overlapping now. <laughs> That's fun. So then, um, so then notice there's a D major arpeggio here in the violin in a, in a few bars. But so again, we're just, we're just um, very easily going through D major in this uh, very elaborate way. So here's the Here's this, um, from the pickup, the, this set of measures here. So this, these measures, I'm going to play those with the pickup. So there's something akin to a cadence here, ish. Um, so it gets a little more extended, but the C sharp B A kind of sets of a dominant, a cadential six four, soundish thing here. And then there's sort of is there a dominant E kind of thing here? Yeah, sort of. And then then there's an arrival here. So the he's. He's offsetting his arrivals by sometimes he he pulls out the arrival on the downbeat and all you get is the um, all you get is the resolution you get the accent and dissonance that should happen at the same time as the chord but he actually just pushes the entire chord back a bar and with its B and F sharp resolving to E and A oh my goodness he's doing it even he's even meaner than I thought he was so but anyway listen to that moment here so this is the from this note, these these couple of bars right here. So yeah, this is like he's setting up a cadence, but it doesn't it doesn't appear. And then what he does is he just repeats this idea slower. And then but he flips to B flats here because he's going to go into D minor on the next page. P signature changes. And now we've got a more elaborate version of this same set, same set of stuff, but we're now in D minor. So the the the, the twirling keeps happening in the violin, the violas, it's actually all together now. Both halves of the cellos are playing the same now triplety um, ascending line. So notice that that first one sounds like the tonic in D minor. So that's so do re me, and here we have so re, so re me fa. So that's a dom dominant sound. Notice the basses then pluck B flat and A, but we still get the F. Now we get F A here. And then there's a G A E A. And then the first violins take on 32nd notes, so a little faster version like of something like the violin violas are doing. And then they do G sharp A, so they're elaborating the A chord at the end of the bar. Harp uh, plays with the basses. And then those are um, horns playing, it's a written E, so those are A's on the bottom. So again, they're just playing that low A. And then this is F. E. Right, so I'm playing, instead of playing F, E, we play F, and I'm playing F sharp, E, we play F, E, to match D minor. So it's the same basic kind of idea with some different kinds of elaborations. And after two bars of that, there's a big-ass wonkin' D minor chord. So this is the timpani playing a roll. That's the tuba. These are the trombone, I'm um, sorry, excuse me, yes. Um, so it's the second and third trombones play F and A, so we have a D minor chord, and those the notes here in the horns also are for D minor, and that's the contrabassoon and the two bassoons playing D. So we get a big D minor chord, just in case if you were confused if we were in D minor or not, here it is. So, 
So we're getting modified versions of these gestures, and now he's adding in G sharps to really um, oomph up what's going on. Because the G sharps are, would emphasize going to A, the dominant, but he doesn't give you that feeling. But we get the F to G sharp feel. But he doesn't resolve it, so that's mean. <laughs> but we're still getting certain similar kinds of gestures that we're getting before. So there's a D, C, B flat to um, in our in our key here. So very clearly D minor. And so he slowly winds up here. So there's more arpeggios in the in the cellos. There's longer melodic lines again. This is all emphasizing D minor. So we have an E is a long upper neighbor to D. But we go up to the third of the chord, F. And then we do an elaboration of D. So C sharp, E, D. We leap up to B flat, which is a half step above A. We leap down and we do C sharp, E, D. And we go up an octave then D and because he didn't resolve the uh, the B flat he go puts a B natural here and then G sharp so the B, B natural G sharp or are, are an elaboration of a which he doesn't give you <laughs> immediately so G sharp and then we go to the a lower neighbor to E D sharp E and then we get our a finally and then we have our diatonic G natural so that's how the, that's the logic of those pitches there. So he's he's landing on uh, notes that you expect to be resolved, but they don't resolve because he's been setting that up the whole time. And that's one of the things that makes you know post Wagner and Wagner harmony work is that sometimes you just put in notes that you don't resolve, and then you get a new chord or a new sonority or something interesting happens, and then you get into Schoenberg, and then just nothing happens. <laughs> that's not true. Lots of stuff happens. Um, but that's the kind of the genealogy of this, if you like. And so it works its way up doing this kind of thing. And so there's a nice uh, G minor-ish arpeggio there. F down to E, D, C. So we're still D minor. Um, and then there's a cool gesture in the clar ba bassoons and clarinets. And that's the, um, yeah, this is bassoon, bass clarinet, clarinet. That's the English horn adding into the gesture. And then we build up this texture as the, everybody gets louder and louder. So the triplets happen in the strings, in the cellos and violas. And it works its way up through the violins up to this high A here. And we get another D, major, D minor chord, big arrival, which is preceded by, in the trumpet, gets to play really loud, and they will. Um, this is an F trumpet, so it sounds up a fourth, so it's A, B, C sharp, C sharp, D, so that's just so la, T, T, Do, and again, notice it's um, that the dissonance happens on the downbeat, but we get a big D here, and they, they do the, um, the woodwinds jump up to C sharp, they hold it out, that's the piccolo really high, and then they leap up to F, and then they do these gestures that again outline D minory things. Um, there is a, but the important thing here is that the chord is receded by low E flat in the bass while A, C sharp, and F happen. So this is the. So that's that's really crazy. This uh, C sharp A F sharp F A C sharp with an E flat. That's really fun. So he so this is late romantic harmony at its finest, everybody. So I'm gonna play this whole passage up to this moment. So so with D minor kind of wandering in the between a couple of chord regular chords in D minor, but notes that don't resolve. And then they sometimes do, but sometimes they resolve late or things happen early. And we just were kind of repeating the same kinds of ideas and they slowly elaborate as they move. And then we go into D minor and do a much more churning version of this until we get up to this big D minor arrival with the half step motion and the bass. So let's take a listen to all of that.
from the very beginning. That's as far as I go. So, something about Mahler. So, I'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk about Beethoven 1, the end of the exposition of Movement 1, as I've been going very slowly for the past few weeks. So I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
All right, I'm back. So here in hour two, we're doing the end of <clears throat> the exposition, the closing section of the first movement of Beethoven one. So let's take a listen to what it sounds like, and then I'm going to slowly analyze it while entering it into Sibelius here, the notation software I'm using. All right, so I'm going to play from the loud section, which is all in G major here. And that starts right here in the score. to the beginning of the fast section. So I'm just going to play the part we have left here. I'm going to stop it there. So this is just recurring um, recurring G major cadences. I'll write that here. So we're in this section of a, of a standard it's not a form of this time period. You take so the symphonies in C, so it starts in the so the fast part starts in C major. In the midst of the exposition, it goes to the dominant here, G major, and then after it uh, does a melody or two in G major and does nice big cadences in them in that key, might go wander around a little bit. There'll be a section usually at the very end of that passage where you're just it's sort of celebratory. Uh, yay, we're in G major. And so this section is generally called the closing section. So the um, might be abbreviated as C, not that, but that, as the letter C. So that's all that's happening here. And so let's put it into the reduction. That is Mahler. I want this. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So let me zoom in a little bit. And let me zoom in over here. All right. So the basses and the cellos in this section and the violas, um, they rest for most of two bars. And then at the end of these two measures, they just go so do. So re so, that is, um, in fixed do So it's those three Ds, uh, yes, going to those three Gs. And amazingly enough, two bars later, they do the exact same thing. So I need to get, I need new measures now. Let's add, if I have 30 more bars yet again. Okay. And so that happens, so it happens the second time. And then they only wait one measure this time. And they do it again, D to G. And they do it one more time, D to G. Notice there's one specific difference here, that the violas play two octave Gs this last time. So this G happens, and both the violas do both of these Gs the last time. And instead of slurring, they play them both fortissimo staccato. So remember that the uh, cellos and the basses are playing from this bottom line. So that is this. these two notes are just the, those two things there. So it's happening in three octaves. Then the second violins are playing a, a tonic pedal. Hmm. And uh, they're going between the open G string at the very bottom of their instrument and an octave higher. And so that G, I don't want that G. I want this one, and then we're going to go, why is that there? What is that for? That's fascinating. Okay. Why is that happening? 
Okay, so let's 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 do that. And then I'm gonna add the octave leaps in and then repeat. So they do this for most of two bars, and then on when the D arrives in the lower strings, they play two notes in the five chord of so it'd be a D major chord. Happens to be D7 here. So they play F sharp and A, and then they go back to playing D. Uh, they go back to playing octave Gs, and then they do that a second time. Who thinks it's going to happen most of the time in all the other parts? So they do this for a second two measures, and then it telescopes to one bar. But notice here. Uh, they play G, G, octave Gs twice over here. And then the third time, they play octave Gs. Instead of playing F sharp A, they play C and D, so the two other notes of our D7. And then that moves to a B, and then the low G, and higher G, low G, higher G, low G. And then they play D, that D and that C, and then they play a triple stop. That's when they play three notes on. Um, they're stopping three strings. That is, they're fingering three strings, and they play three notes at the same time, or as close to as possible. They play that G, D, and B. Okay. Then, in the uh, in the first violins, they play that. They arrive on that G, and then they have this melodic idea. So F, G, so dotted quarter note G, and then they go down the scale from Do here, the tonic, down to 7, 6, 5, uh, 1, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. So they're filling in the gap between resolving um, T, Do, and Fa, Mi. So da, di, ba, di. And so they're just filling in that space with this uh, dotted rhythm here. So those two gestures get uh, connected with, so we're doing, and, so that's a really lovely way to connect those together, just a scalar thing. And guess what? That happens, that happens for the next, the next two bars does exactly the same thing yet again. Ooh. There it is. But instead of getting the because he wants to do it a bunch of times in a row, the C B doesn't happen. Instead he restarts the F sharp to G line. Da F G F sharp G F sharp E D C F, F sharp E D C and then that happens one more time. This should all be voice two. And then happens there. And then with the second violins, I'm gonna put this all in voice one now. They play this D, an A above that, and then F sharp above that. And then they play the a quadruple stop, all four strings. They'll have to do a big, uh, play the low ones first. They add a G on top of what the second violins had. Lovely. And then there's a rest measure for everybody in the strings. Now when we go up to the brass and winds, brass and woodwinds, the timpani and the horns, trumpets, flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons. So the that's the timpani note. And this G up here is the uh, trumpet notes, the two trumpet players. Remember the trumpets are in C, so sound is written. And the horns are also in C and they sound an octave lower than written, which is this octave G that holds for a measure and three quarter notes. Then they leap up to this D, both of them. So that's the fun part about natural horns. So the a C horn here, well, that'll be the lowest pedal note they'll have is this C here. And then 
they apparently have actually it's actually is it really that this must be even lower than that it must be the one way down there but they usually can't even play that note it's so far down so they have this G yeah they have then this C then they should be able to play yeah they can play the so um, I'm gonna write it as this is what it sounds like and this is what it would be written as on a horn like for this this notation so this is what it would be notated as and this is what it sounds like so they'd be have this C this G this C we're gonna start going eighth notes then they'd have um, this E and then this G and then they'd have a a very flat B flat and then C and D and E and so on they'd have a they'd also have a kind of oddly uh, F here it's like halfway in between but you know when they can use their hand they can make these modifications so this is the notes they have available so in order for the low horn they're playing this they're playing this written G and this written G so this is all down an octave so for an order for them to play two notes in a five chord in the in the dominant right because there it's a C horn and we're playing in G so we want to emphasize G with G B uh, with a D F sharp and A notice there's no F sharp there's no A the only notes available is that D notated there that sounds down here so it means that if you really want this, the, the nice G's, which are these two notated and these two sounding, means that you have to have the second horn leap from this G down here to that D there. And that happens all the time in this, in this period of music, having the second horn do gigantic leaps like that. They're not as far apart as you think um, in terms of the, the pressure requires. I mean, it's still really hard to do, but... It's, it's easier than you might think because of how spaced the partials are down there. Because you're only having to go across, what, four notes or something? Well, I had them written out. So what's it? Uh, so it's like a one, two, three, four, five, six. It's six notes. Still hard. But, you know, catching some of them would be difficult. So, but they get used to it. So that's what happens there. And then that on the next measure we get the timpani gets that low G there and the horns still do their they repeat their help holding those low G's and then we get the trumpets return the return the great return of the trumpets okay so uh, the trumpets have the same problem it's just an octave higher so they all need they, everybody needs to play D down to that G they could, the second horn trumpet could play the G down here but that'd be pretty darn low so that's that and then the horns are playing dotted ones of those and the timpanist remember only has two drums C and G so he can only play G here He or she or whatever you want to say. Um, so I want, I just want the second, the human being who's playing the timpani. Okay, so that's 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 the horns and trumpets and timpani there, and then that all happens again. So let me do this so I can get everybody. That's going to cause a problem there. So let me. Just doing that so that I can copy it. Um, okay, and then those two happen again. Boom, boom. Okay, and then we get the G down there. And that's the trumpet G's. And then the horns play this G and D and then play octave G's a bunch of times which I'll probably renotate this later but so I'm not going to get into the first ending right now
But so there's just the woodwinds and the horns who play in those, in that couple of measures that are empty otherwise. Then we get the woodwinds. So the bassoons play these two Gs, and then they play. Um, do, 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 do. do I want to do that? I'm deciding how I want to write this out. Um, we're going to put the bassoons in the treble clef here, just for my for the ease of doing this. So they play this E and C. They both go down a set to B and D, then A and C, and so on. So B, D, C, E, and B, D. And then they play that A and that G. And then they play those two notes there. The clarinets have this G and that G. And then on this, on the cadence, the two note cadence here, two chord cadence is G, F sharp to G. Remember the clarinets are in C in this score. Then the oboes play this bassoon gesture up an octave. So I need this note and then that note. And then the second oboe is playing C to B. The first oboe is doubling the second, the first clarinet. This is the flute notes, and then they play the um, the clarinets up an octave. So it happens like that. And now that all repeats, uh, basically. So this the this gesture happens. So the oboes and bassoons fill in the gap, and then we get the A, the A and the C going to G and B. And so the oboes play C and A as well, going to G and B. The flutes have F sharps going to, uh, oof, really, well, I don't know. Jeff G, so, so do the clarinets. I'm gonna take that one out. Okay, so now the second clar the two clarinets and the first flute join the first violin line. Da -da -da -dum -ba -da -da -dum -ba -bum. Just the last two times. So the notating of this is going to get a little more hectic. So we're going to put all of the all of this in a second voice. So we have C. We're going to keep doing. Okay, here I'm going to I'm going to go back. I'm going to put this in the other system now. Okay, so I'm going to need and there should be a D here, so yep, okay, so that's what that should happen. Okay, okay, so this whole measure should happen exactly the same with what happened below. Yeah, so that's just a repetition. Yeah, because that's the bassoon line. And the D is the horn note, note. Those are horn notes. Okay. And then up here, the oboes are playing this, 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 and then they mimic what I had lower. And then this should all be like this. And then and then that happens a second time. Matching again, and that's the trumpet notes, the D and the G. And then above this, so da -dum -bum -bum. And so this is going to become voice one. And then I'm going to, so this G happened, and so does that G. So now this dotted G is going to be like that. And then we're going to get the first violin line in three octaves. D. Okay, and then that happens again. So let me get, is that all in one voice? It is. Okay, so let's copy voice one over. And then that's the three octaves of F sharps. 
And what am I leaving out here? So there's the second, the flute. Second flute here doubles the first oboe, C, B. And then on the very end of this, then we'll just make everybody here play voice one. So, no, actually, I didn't want to do that. Let's see the second voice. So F sharp, and then the C, and then this B, B. Make that voice two to match. So that's the second flute. First flute goes up to whole note G. The two clarinets, they go up to from F sharp to G to match that. And the bassoons move to half note G and B. Then they double the horns on that beat. Sounds good. And then the second, the first oboe joins on that G, so it plays the G as well. Okay, so that's all of that. So now we're going to analyze this section up to there. Then I'm going to deal with what happens directly after that in a moment. Okay. So as I said, this is just basically repeated cadences um, with a new gesture of da 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 bum bum, which I don't know. Does that ever? Does that have anything like it? We've never used two sixteenth notes in a row. I don't think, other than like tremolo passages. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah, there have never been up to this point two sixteenth notes that were different pitches in a row other than, well, there's that four note pattern that happened in the previous loud section. Every other time it was just the dotted rhythm. Okay, so it is a, it is a new rhythm, which is what I believed. Okay, so, so what happens here is that there's a long extended tonic pedal, and then there's just a F sharp dominant seventh chord I'm sorry, D dominant seventh chord. It has an F sharp in it, which makes it five seven. So three Ds, F sharp, A, and C, A, C, D, F sharp, C, F sharp, and F sharp. So that's five seven. And amazingly enough, it resolves to one. Notice again, the one has no D in it. It's just G and B. So the F sharp, the D goes to G, the F sharp goes to G, and the C goes to B. That's what happens. And, uh, that's the whole pattern. And then that repeats. I'll get into what happens in between in a moment. So that repeats, that chord happens again. Then it shortens to one measure and then it comes in and guess what, it's all the same thing. D, F sharp, A, and C all resolve to G or B. So that's five, seven, to one. And then that happens a second time. And then we repeat and we hold the G for a bar Ba, ba, and a couple of them join on the G. We actually get a D on this moment here um, as a part of the horn line. First horn does that. So we get a D holding to D there. So, and that's, that's why this is so straightforward. It's just an opportunity to do the D, G, G major PAC four more times. So let's listen from the previous cadence. Just four more, just four more G major cadences while holding out a tonic pedal. So then notice during the pedal what happens. So the inner voices, that is the woodwinds here, the flute, the oboes and bassoons, they're doing, um, they're moving back and forth between four and five by doing similar scalar passages up and down. So they're, they move to C and E with our G is a four harmony. So if I had it do, say, it's, uh, that would be like a pedal four, six, four harmony. And then that moves to one. So the G and the B, and then we get A and C with the G. So A, C, and G 
um, is like a So those are the upper two notes of a 5-7, a 5-7 chord. Now you could think of it as like a 2-4-2. Two, two. No, not really. I wouldn't do that. So I'm just going to put, I'm going to put 5-7. So notice that it gets the F sharp comes in here. So those three notes, the F sharp, A, and D, are implying a dominant. So we're going tonic, predominant, tonic, dominant. And we're going to do that a couple of times in a row, but they go in the opposite direction here. So they go down to the one, which they get on the downbeat. And then so we get, since we're going in the opposite direction, so the A and the C and the F sharp return two beats later. Hmm. Not what I wanted. I wanted this. Let me drag this over. E passing tone, we go back to one, and then that happens again. So there's an implied pedal 6-4, and then there are a couple of dominants. If you want to call them sevens, I don't care. The, the Roman numeral is less important. I'm really noticing the function here. So there's a, uh, there's a predominant or plagal on the pedal, and then during the pedal there are a three dominant. There are two dominants. And then we get our full our full five seven after that occurs. So listen to that happen. And then that all repeats. And so then what we get is that and then we just do ba da da di. So this this gesture with this gesture happens together. So instead of getting this one, we get the descent. So both of them descend here. So here this becomes this is the, the sort of a four six four. So this F sharp here becomes a passing tone instead of the E. And then we get D and that's one. And then five one. So it's just an elaboration of our one. Um, if you want to think of it as F sharp A C as a um, as a seven half diminished, that's fine too. I don't really care. And it's just, either way, it's just an elaboration of the one that's been being held. And then happens twice. And that's it. So that's this section. And now we're going to get to the, the closing is just four repeated, four, four more uh, PACs in G major. Uh, so notice the rate of change. So we had four more cadences, but it's two bars, a cadence, two bars, a cadence, one bar, a cadence, one bar, a cadence. So that's three two measure chunks. So it's six bars total. And then, oh, it's after two, one, two, so it happens on the third bar, right? So, but it's two measures in the end. So the, then from there we get what's called a retransition. I've mentioned one of these before in one of the previous episodes, is that, uh, so a transition, the difference here is a transition, um, takes you away from the home key. So we're modulating or moving to get to somewhere else. And a retransition takes you back to the home key. So this is a retransition in the last few bars of the exposition here. You could actually say the exposition is over and this is the thing, this is the linking passage. But either way is fine. It doesn't, that's that's of um, that's of minimal importance to the current project. Whether or not you distinguish this as in the exposition or not, <laughs> uh, I'll let I'll let theorists argue about that. So the um, so what happens next is so we get a four bar retransition. So we get our G. 
So G is the tonic. And then the rest is, so then we get G's on the second one halfway through the bar. And then um, Beethoven immediately disturbs this G major as tonic by having all of the woodwinds do an arpeggio down a G7 chord from G, F, D, B, G, F, D. And then they arrive on C. So this allows them to, it basically just creates a G as a dominant seventh chord. So that means that I'm going to immediately from that moment, because I'm going to write the notes in in a moment, but I need to add one extra thing here. I need to do this. And the text needs to be formatted bigger. So we, we flip our tonic flips to a dominant with the adding of F natural. So let me write this in here. So the horns were playing these G's. They play them in a row and then they hold for two measures, those two G's. The bassoons have these two G's and then they go down to F natural here. Then they go down to D. And then here they have, okay, we're gonna go B. B and then G and then F natural again and then D. And so the clarinets are holding these G's and then they go down to F natural here and then D and then B and then G and then then the then the second leaps up to join the first on this G actually on the G then they have F and D. The second oboe, I called it the first oboe before, the second oboist plays G, F, D, G, and then the first oboe joins an octave higher, G, F, D, and then the first flute holds for a, a whole note G and goes down the upper octave of F to D to B, and then the second flute joins with this first oboe. So if the first oboe and both flutes play the last three notes together. And now that's all that is. And interestingly enough, after two bars, because we've been going at a two bar clip, the strings play our G7 chord lovingly. So that's the cello, there's the bass, the violas are playing this G and the one an octave higher than that. And then I'm gonna play, I'm gonna write this G here too because it's in the second violin. And there's a D and a B. And they just play a G triad. So G, I'm sorry, that's not true. I'm mistaken, I knew there was one. G, so these two Gs, and then this G, which is right here. And that is our is our friend F. And it's this F right here. So it's a G7 because of the violas. And then they play, amazingly enough, the pickup to the opening tune. G, B, and then they arrive on C because they all played the C at the end of the, the very first note of the exposition. They all played C together because they were playing that big scale, if you remember from before. So that's the, that's the cellos, there's the basses, there's the violas, and I'll write this upper octave again here for the strings. And so that pickup, that's the pickup to the exposition. And that's all five, seven. And then we wander, we wind our way all the way back and do it all again. And, and then the second ending is the retransition again. All of the notes here in the winds are the same. It's just these two bars. And do I want to write this? Do I want to put the endings in? Not really. 
So there are these two bars. And this chord in the strings is exactly the same as the first time. And they don't play the pickup the second time. And then I'm going to give us the first chord of the, rec of, of the development so that we know what it is. And so the basses play a C sharp down there. That's the cello C sharp. The viola C sharp is that one right there. The second violins play C sharp E and A. And then the first violins play octave A's. The trumpets enter on one of the notes that's available. They play E. A dotted, dotted half note E. The horns play those two same E's, but down an octave. So this E and this E. The bassoons play the C sharp. The clarinets leap to E and A here, so that E and this A. The oboes play those C, same E and A, and the flutes play the E above that and the A above that. And so that's an A major triad in first inversion, which is nowhere near C major. And it's not anywhere near G major either, really. So it's the five of five in G. So it's unexpected. And so that unexpected chord is the beginning of the development proper. So the first time it's a retransition away from the tonic, away from, from the dominant to the tonic. And then in the second ending, it instead transitions us to somewhere very far away, farther away from C. So that's cool. And so I'll, we'll label that later. Okay, so I've got 15 more minutes, so let's see what needs to take place today. Okay, so um, there is um, some composing like this that I want to do, but I'm going to save that for tomorrow. So let me see. I was keeping, yeah, right, we were going to, I was going to compose, I haven't composed anything since the second, end of the second theme, so... The so I was going to compose this. Yeah, I was going to um, write something that mimicked the loud section that leads that is the end of the second theme into the closing section. So I was going to write that as one big thing, which I'll do tomorrow. So that means we're going to do this now. So we're going to take a bigger view of this music now. Uh, in a few ways. The first one I'm going to do is we're going to notice the dynamics of the music up to this point. So in our intro, we had forte pianos. Let me let me make everything. Let me bold things. That's not what I wanted. Boop boop boop. I should be able to bold and okay. okay. So what what is okay, it should be that and then that. There we go. But I wanted it bold. There we go. Okay, so we get forte pianos and then we crescendo to forte. And then it immediately becomes piano. Then the music stays piano for a while. And then we get a long crescendo. So that's that happens for a while. We get a crescendo. Which then we get a measure of forte. I'm I'm hitting the wrong things, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, so I wanted it. Okay, that's why I'm hitting. I'm hitting. I want bold and then that. Okay, so then we get forte for a measure. Then we get piano for a measure. And then we get. And then it crescendos again. 
and then we get forte for two measures and then we get a decrescendo a diminuendo so I'm going to notate that like this and then we get piano and that's the introduction and so there's the chord everybody resolves to at the end of the exposition uh, the at the end of the retransition at the very end this is where they come back to and they all play this chord so Beethoven needed to set up in the previous bar something to allow him to get to that chord all right so then so let's undo that with view bold no okay so then the exposition and so the the first theme the primary theme which is p um, first theme. I'm just gonna write it this way. I've been using the old terminology, the older terminology of first theme. Um, so it's been starts piano, which then after a few bars crescendos, and then there's an immediate drop to piano, and then the crescendo returns and here we get a sforzando so then notice that that sforzando doesn't mean it's loud yet it just means that that's punchier than what it has been and then we get a series of those and then we crescendo again and then we get fortissimo Fortissimo. Fortissimo. Okay, so, um, fortissimo. So that's our first fortissimo, is this loud uh, transition music. That's all. So for our retransition. So notice that that's where this takes the, the transition section. This is a big major section in a sonata form. Often labeled that way. So this texture shift and dynamic shift helps mark some of the sections for us. And then it just stays this way for a while. There are sforzandi along the way, but it's that way for a very long time. And then there's a crescendo, <laughs> a long one, multiple measures long. And then we're crescendo back to fortissimo. And then this, which then throws us to our medial cisura. And then with our pickup, we're in our second theme or primary area or secondary area, if you like, second theme. And we can breathe that, that as S. And we are immediately back to, so notice the we're back to a piano dynamic. And this is piano for a while. Again, we get Sforzandi inside the piano dynamic, but it stays piano for a long time. And then there's a dramatic shift in the second after the there's a cadence that doesn't end up happening here and we get a dramatic shift to forte after a while i want that to be lowercase and then there are a bunch of sforzandi and this forte is a little shorter then there's uh there's a crescendo to fortissimo which then is immediately pulled back to our very first pianissimo dynamic. And this pianissimo marks this contrasting key, um, you know, this other melody that we have in the, um, in the G major second theme area. So we get a big cadence and then this dynamic shift.
There are some swell dynamics in the woodwinds. Notice the strings don't have them those two times, so it's just up there. And after a long part of this, we crescendo over three bars to forte at the end of a cadence here. And so then, this is a third section, if you like, in the secondary theme. If you want to label as some of this. I don't think any of this is closing material because it, it's too active. And so we've got forte with lots of sforzandi. And then halfway through this section, uh, at least partway through, we get a sfort a, a fortissimo dynamic. And notice that this is the exact moment when we had the um, what was this? This is the we get something unexpected here. Let me remember, remind myself what that is. Yeah. So it's there's a there's an unexpected E major chord here where the dynamic switches to fortissimo. Right, so we're going along and we have, we're loud, and we do a very common thing in G. We're on a G over B chord, 1, 6. And then this 7 of A is mildly unexpected. But that 7 of A is supposed to resolve to A minor. I'm sorry, to, sorry it's a 7 of E. What did I do? That? Oh, it's over A. That's why it's over A. This is a 7 of E, right? So that's mildly unexpected, but we expect it to go to E minor. This is We're expecting E minor because we're in G, and G major has an E minor chord in it. And because he does an E major triad that has a secondary function to, um, to A, rather than an E minor chord that would just be a 6, that's a very... So he, he amps the pressure here by increasing the dynamic to make and so it's it's unexpected in two ways right dynamically that he hasn't done a dramatic shift in the middle of a phrase before like this up and it's the loudest dynamic he'll use for for fortissimo and there's an e major chord that's going to throw the music into a, a, a little bit off balance here um and then into that descending fully diminished seventh chord. So that the the dynamic plays a very important role in the effect of the music here. And so it's working together with the harmonic surprise. And then we get a bunch of Swartzandi to give us the last part of our cadence here. And notice we get the return of fourth day pianos for the closing here. We haven't seen them since the beginning. So forte piano and tonic pedals and a bunch of sforzandi. And then at the very end of this section, a little section is, is the fortissimo. Bum, bum. And then for the retransition here, we get our decrescendo. But notice there's there's a decrescendo in the winds that lasts four bars to get back to the piano at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the exposition, but the strings play are told to play their chord fortissimo. So it's ba da dee da. <laughs> That's what happens, and then they play an immediate piano. There's a shift to the piano at the end. Decrescendo. Can I spell? I can. And then it goes to piano. There's a sudden drop in the strings, but it's been piano in the winds. It gets the piano there. So, or it's around there. So notice that the dynamic structure of this movement, of this piece up to this point, is very important to how the structure of the, you understand the harmonic structure of the piece, the rhythmic structure of the piece, the, you know, what measures are important. 
all sorts of things. And then there is also the dynamic contrasts of the various sforzandi that play against that rhythmic shape. But so the the fact that the part the only section of the music so far that's in minor is pianissimo, the softest dynamic he's used, that there is an unexpected harmonic shift in this last section. Um, I'm sorry, it's this one here that uh, allows that um, that that keeps ratcheting up the energy, so it doesn't feel like you're stopping yet, right? He says, you should have, you know, we did three big, we've done three sections in the secondary theme already, um, the second theme, and we don't need to. I mean, you know, he's he's got to keep your attention. <laughs> So then, that uh, so all of this stuff is working together in this piece. Sometimes against, each, sometimes offsetting each other. Sometimes a little different, but the most of the time, the dynamic shifts are very important to the structural moments when we end something and start something new. And so it's they're they're playing off each other. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to play the whole beginning up to this point in the recording, the you know the MIDI that I have. Just get an idea of this dynamic world that happens here and how it lines up with the various formal bits, you know, formal meaning in the form. So the intro, the you know the first theme, the transitions, and so on. Not as in like that dance you went to when you were in junior and high school or something a formal yeah no okay so let's listen up to there in the recording so that we know what all this sounds like going back to the beginning how oh, exciting
And so there you go. Notice the ways in which the dynamics do and don't align up with the formal elements. Oftentimes they do, or sometimes they do, to set up something else that'll happen when the change happens. So, like, uh, what's the good example here? Is like so. So there's a it gets loud for the cadence here, so that it's loud for the little section afterward for the transition. So the the fortissimo arrives right before the transition occurs. So the fortissimo is actually over here. So I I, I messed that up when I was going through it the first time. So <clears throat> so we've gone through the entire exposition. We looked at the dynamics today. So uh, what I'll do next time in the second hour tomorrow is I'm going to take the um, the music from this, uh, what was it, it's the G major section here. It's this arrival right here. We're going to go through the end of the exposition. So it's this, three measures, this, and this. And I'm going to write something that's like this uh, ending celebratory, you know, with some extra fun stuff and then a closing section. Uh, to show how to sort of distill this down and to write something similar using similar techniques to what Beethoven is doing here. So I will be back tomorrow for episode 19. Uh, probably, I don't know if I'll probably do Mahler 9 again because the, the, it just took so long for me to write that out. So maybe something, maybe I'll do that Haydn that I had the idea for you today. Um, I'm not sure. I'll decide tomorrow. And then I will uh, work on more with um, writing like Beethoven in the second hour. So that'll be episode 19 tomorrow. So this one has been episode 18 of my symphonizing project here on Music Corner. I'm David Cuomo. Have a great day.